Daniel chapter 7, the third of the chapters on the Ark of the Covenant in 1 Samuel. As we move into chapter 8 next week, we'll be lo- we're beginning to look at the kingships, uh, the people saying, we don't want God to rule over us, we want a king like our neighbors, an earthly king. And Saul will start to manifest himself and come on the stage, and we look forward to that. But today, we're finishing up with the Ark of the Covenant returning to the Lord. We saw that last week after it was captured by the Philistines the week before. And then now in chapter 7, we see that there's things that go along with returning to the Lord, right? And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning is returning to the Lord. Before we jump in, I wanted to just say a couple things about returning to something. You know, there's a, most of us have experienced returning to something, right? We've been looking at that a little bit, and, and this week I was catching an old movie um, with Tom Hanks and Kevin Bacon and a couple guys called Apollo 13. Do you, some of you probably even remember Apollo 13, right? You were old enough to be alive when that actually occurred, and uh, we, we had a problem. We were sending up one of our third or fourth uh, Apollo rockets up to space. We were supposed to land on the moon again, much like they did in 1969 with Neil Armstrong, and and that group was supposed to land on the moon and survey it and expand our knowledge of outer space and other planets in the moon. But as soon as they took off, they had a couple of problems. They had a, an auction tank that exploded, uh, some other gas things, some damage from the wreckage on their, their uh, capsule and, and those kinds of things. And suddenly, instead of the highlight of their careers landing on the moon, something they trained their whole lives for, Suddenly, the only thing that they cared about was what? Returning home. You know, suddenly everybody became a prayer warrior. Everybody in Houston became a prayer warrior. Everybody in the United States became a prayer warrior. People around the United, all over the world were praying for them. The astronauts even talked about we became men of prayer, right? Because way out there, things go wrong and there's nothing. And so through a a series of uh, mechanical blessings, engineering marvels and ultimately the miracle of God those three men were able to return to the earth and then they they talked in follow-up interviews about just the tremendous blessing it was to be restored back to terra firma the earth to be back on the earth again right if you've ever traveled out of the country you kind of understand some of that you go to a third world country um, one time when Kim and I were doing mission work we were in Ecuador and while we were in Ecuador on the fifth day, we were in Quito, the capital. Quito's kind of a tough city, but we were used to that. And we were downtown at the mall with a bunch of Colombians and our group and had the time in the mall. It was our day to relax a little bit from work and came back to the, the vans and got in the vans. And they had the radio on. Of course, I don't speak Spanish, and so I didn't know what was being said, but six-star translator. I was like, what are they talking about? They sound like they're pretty vigorous on the radio. He goes, oh, that's no big deal. So we kept going on. By the way, if you're on a mission trip and someone says it's no big deal, that's something you should pay attention to, okay? But I'm kind of dense. I wasn't with the program. A little bit later, you could really hear him talking pretty vigorous on the radio, and I said, hey, Sixto, what's that all about? And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. Everything's good. Third time, about 10.30 that night, I said, hey, Sixto, sounds like the radio's going to melt down, okay? These guys are bent about something. What's going on? Finally, he said to him, well, looks like there's going to be a coup. And the government could fall tonight by midnight. Uh, okay, that's great. Suddenly I was not worried about my Ecuadorian friends. Suddenly I was worried about my own skin, right? Uh, six, though, what happens to the Americans to get out, dude? Well, you can't go to the airport. Uh, so how do we get home? Well, we'll have to sneak you to the, to the coastline and send you on a ship. Black, and all these things started flowing through my head, right? And suddenly, just the idea of getting back to the United States seemed like just wonderful sweet water, better than Mountain Dew. So when we got back from that trip, which we did get to fly, the government did not fall, Uh, the president apologized to his cabinet that he insulted, they reinstated him, it stayed, but when we flew home and we landed in Miami International Airport, when we got off the plane, I literally felt like getting down and kissing the ground, you know? The land of the free, the home of the brave kind of thing. Well, that's how it is when we return to the Lord. 
like those astronauts on Apollo 13, like we felt coming back from a harrowing experience of possibly being stuck in a foreign country that was going south, you know how sweet it is when you're back to the very thing that you need. Amen? It's the very thing that you need. And so all of us, believers and non-believers both, if you're a non-believer, you need to, for the very first time, turn to the Lord in repentance and faith. If you're a believer, it's an ongoing practice of our lives that we need to return to the Lord over and over and over. Repentance isn't just something that gets us into the kingdom of God. Repentance is something that continues us in the kingdom of God. It is a hallmark of God's people, and we're going to see that here today, okay? So chapter 7, verse 1, I want you to think about the first thing that we see in returning to the Lord, which is repentance in chapters two, I'm chapter 7, verses 2 through 4. This is what it says. So the men of Kirith Jerem came and took up the ark of the Lord, and they brought it down to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to guard the ark of the Lord. And the ark remained at Kirith Jerem a long time, 20 years in all. Then all the people of Israel did what? They did what? They turned back to the Lord. Now, see, there was a huge cumulative effect. As the ark came back into their presence, as they saw God working in their lives, the whole nation that had been, everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes, as it says in the book of Judges, we talked about that being the context. Suddenly, they're turning back to the Lord. They're turning back in droves to the Lord, right? And then it says in verse 3, So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, in other words, he's kind of challenging them. If you're serious about this, if you're serious about this, then rid yourselves of foreign gods and the asterisks and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their attention, I mean their, their gods, veils, and asterisks, and serve the Lord only, right? So you kind of look at that last piece. It's translated also that they mourned, in another translation, that they mourned and they sought after the Lord. So the very first thing that we need in returning to the Lord is an attitude change, an attitude of repentance, which means that we, we turn away from whatever we're relying upon. In this case, they were relying upon the Baal statues and the little idols and the Asherah. Those were these tall poles in high places, these fertility gods, the, the Baals that was the son of Dagon that we already looked at, the Philistine god, and, and he was the god of, inf- of fertility, and, his, and then the Asherah was the female deity, and together they kind of made the fields fertile and all this stuff. And And Israel had been relying upon them. But now that they see God's power, they are turning away from that nonsense, and they're turning back towards the Lord. They've had a change of heart, and that's what repentance means. It means literally to turn from one direction towards the other. And in this case, from ourselves to God, right? From false gods to the one true God. It's about directionality. And so if you're asking yourself today, Have I been repentant? Am I working that into my life? Or do I need to engage in that? It's about directionality. It's about a vector. It's about where you're pointing towards and what your focus is at and where you're moving in your Christian walk. And so if that vector, if that arrow, if that direction is not towards Jesus Christ, then you're not repentant. You need to turn away from whatever it is it's pointed towards and be directional towards Jesus Christ. Does that make some sense? So the very beginning of returning to the Lord is about repentance. And, and repentance is, is, is about what? There's a few different pieces of this. One is repentance is about sorrow for our sins against God. Sorrow for our sins against God. Listen to this. It says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But worldly sorrow leads to death, Right? Do you guys know what worldly sorrow is? I bet you do. You've ever worked through your kids? Your kids did something they weren't supposed to do and you caught them in it red-handed? And you say, hey, I told you not to eat any cookies. How come you're eating cookies? How come you got a cookie in your hand and a cookie in your mouth? Well, mama, I'm sorry. Now, the real question is, are they sorry that they disobeyed you? Are they sorry for the consequences that are coming because you caught them, right? That's the difference between worldly and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is, I'm sorry because you caught me with my hand in the cookie jar and because you're going to light up my tush. That's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow is, I'm sorry that I disobeyed you 
because I hurt my relationship with you, Mama. And whenever you can move a child from childlike worldly sorrow and move them to a place where they really care about their relationship with you, now we're getting somewhere. And it's the same way with us with God. If we're just repenting to God because we want to avoid consequences, which we've already looked at the last few weeks, that's not true repentance. True repentance is we care that we've harmed our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? That we've sinned against God, a God that loves us and cares for us and is there for us. We've sinned against, and so that's an issue. So, so part of repentance is sorrow, a godly sorrow, right? Part of it is seeking God on whose terms? His terms. Seeking God on his terms. You know, here Samuel, the great man of God, says, if you're returning, verse 2 or verse 3 halfway, if you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then do this. Prove it. Rid yourselves of these idols. Right? And so part of it is godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow, but part of repentance, another aspect of it, is that we actually seek God. We turn away from whatever's filling our lives and trying to meet our needs, and we turn to the Lord God Almighty to do that instead. We turn from our bank account fulfilling our needs with our money to Jesus Christ fulfilling our needs. We turn away from relationships alone that are filling our needs, we think. They're coming up short. And we turn to Jesus Christ to fill our needs. That's what it's about. It's about seeking God. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul, Deuteronomy 4.29. Why? Because God is seeking a relationship with us. The book of Psalms says that he is looking down from heaven. First Chronicles talks about this too. The Chronicles talk about this. They're looking down from heaven, God is, to see if those, there are those who will seek God. Psalms 14 too, right? And so Israel had been away from God for a long time. And one of the consequences of their rebellion was that they were subject to the Philistines. And now I'm sure that they're miserable the whole time that they're under Philistine control. But there's something different now. Now there's mourning. Now there is literal translation in the Hebrew is lamenting after the Lord. In other words, they're not just sorry because of the consequence of the Philistines. They're sorry that they turned away from God and trusted in something else other than Him. They genuinely care about their relationship with the Almighty. And so as we're returning to the Lord, true repentance always involves sorrow for our sin and seeking after the Lord. Not the consequences, but the hurt to our God. It's about a vertical dimension for our Lord and ourselves. It's about what affects our relationship with God. And so true turning back to the Lord should begin with repentance, with a sorrow and a seeking and a restoration, right? Now, when I was in college, <coughs> I've talked about at the end of my high school years, I kind of walked away from the Lord, and I made a, a foolish decision through a series of things, but in college, I could feel God disciplining me and moving me back towards Him. And so I started attending this Bible study with Camp Crusade for Christ, and and I was in Dave Mikesell's Bible study, meeting in his tiny little dorm room. They'd pack nine of us dudes in there. And, and we'd be meeting on Monday nights. And about the fifth one that I attended, Dave was talking about this little diagram that Campus Crusade for Christ has, a little, a little throne. And who's on the throne of your heart? Jesus, which is represented by a cross, or S, which is represented by self. And he was talking about, have you been putting yourself on the throne of your life? Have you kicked Christ to the curb? And as he's talking about it, I break down crying like an absolute idiot, okay? Just crazy. And the next thing I know, I'm on the floor on my knees, shaking, and don't even know what's happening to me. And I knew I had to get right with God, and Dave, in his wisdom, grabbed three other guys and got down there with me and led me to get right with God. And you could feel the burden lift from me. It was, it was like a thousand pounds on my shoulders were now gone. Like I could dance with light feet again. It was a totally different thing. And I, and I was different from that moment on. I got, got right with God. And that's what's going on here with the Israelites. And then in verse 3 where it says, get rid of these foreign gods. Get rid of these bales and these asherahs, right? The question that we had to pull away from that is, what are the rivals to God in our life? Whenever we walk away from the Lord, even a little bit, even a small step, it's never for nothing. It's always for something. Whenever you take a step away from God, 
it's always a step towards something or someone other than him. So we need to ask ourselves as a point of application, if we're going to repent and return to the Lord, what are our rivals that we need to put brutally before the Lord and let go of? For the Israelites, it was the Baals and Asherahs. It was their faith in the relic of the Ark of the Covenant and not the God of the Ark of the Covenant. But for us, it can be a lot of different things. We've been talking about this the last few weeks. Issues of power and control, that we put those issues and those needs before God. Issues of comfort and ease, issues of security and significance. These different things that we make gods in our lives, that we put before the Lord, that we're not willing to submit to the Lord of, we have to be serious about dealing with those things as rivals to God. Have you ever thought about them as rivals to the Lord in your life? You know, alcohol can be a rival to the Lord in your life, right? If you have an addiction issue. Pornography can be a rival to the Lord if you have an addiction to that. Food can be a rival to the Lord if you overeat or, in some cases, starve yourself, right? You can make a lot of things, different things, idols, but they all have one thing in common. None of them are submissive to Jesus. So when you're looking for those rivals in your life, you need to ask yourself, are these things that I think so good, are they submitted to Jesus Christ and in a proper relationship in my life? Most of the time, our rivals, our gods, are good things that have become God things, as I've said. We need to be careful to look at our lives and root those things out and get rid of them and dispense of them, right? We must identify these idols and put them aside. The second step that we see in this text in verse 5 through 11 is, is part of returning to the Lord is found in prayer. Prayer is essential to our returning to the Lord, right? Verse 5, then Samuel said, assemble Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and they poured it out before the Lord. And on that day they fasted and they were there they confessed, we have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader or judge of Israel at Mizpah. Verse 7, when the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard this, they were afraid because of the Philistines. And they said to Samuel, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And he cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. Over and over and over, just in a small bit, and we haven't even read 10 and 11, we see that Samuel cries out. He intercedes for them. And they desire prayer, right? As they return into the Lord, they're asking for their prayer. They're saying, do not stop. Verse 8, do not stop crying out to the Lord for us. Intercede for us. Be there for us. Talk to the Lord for us, right? Now, Mizpah was about seven miles north of Jerusalem, and it was the center of Israelite nation at the time. And, and we see in Judges 19 that all the tribes gathered there to figure out what to do with the, the bad tribe, Benjamites, that had killed the concubine. We see that later on in 1 Samuel 10 that, that Saul will be presented as king at Mizpah. And so Mizpah is kind of like the big dog right now before Jerusalem. It's kind of like the big place where you meet and you do all those things. And yet when they meet there, all of the Israel together, when they meet all these rulers, what is the very first thing that they want in dealing with the Philistines? Do they want better weapons to deal with the Philistines? Do they want better battle tactics to deal with the Philistines? Do they want to be anointed to deal with the Philistines? No. They want the man of God, Samuel, to cry out in prayer to the Lord for them. They want prayer to be center stage, right? Now, I want you to think about this. When it comes to returning to the Lord, repentance and faith are not like step one and step two, but instead they're like co-occurring steps. Does that make some sense to you? They both go on at the same time. Okay, but, but prayer, where repentance is a heart change, is directional. Prayer is the expression of that heart change. Does that make some sense to you? The repentance is the changing of your attitude in your heart. It's directional towards God. But prayer is the expression of that where we cry out to the Lord. How many of you have been hurting at some time when you're a little bit away from the Lord and you cry it out to the Lord, right? You cry it out to the Lord and you connected to God. Prayer connects us 
to the Almighty, connects us to the throne of grace, right? In fact, in first, in not first, but in Hebrews chapter 4, it says that we should boldly approach God's throne, that we may receive grace and help in our time of need. Verse 16, right? And so God wants us to pray to him. God wants us to do those things. And it is important that we pray, and it's important that we have other believers pray for us. This week when I was praying for when I was praying and I was studying for this, and we're going to look at different passages in here, but I was looking at one of the greatest interceders in the scriptures along with Jesus. The type in the Old Testament of Jesus of an interceder was Moses. When we prayed, when we preached through the book of Exodus, when we went through that, and if you also go through numbers at the same time, which I was doing when I was studying for that for, for the sermon series, you see Moses over and over and over interceding for God's people. I don't mean like once, twice, three. I mean like ten times. You see it over and over and over that Moses goes before the Lord and he intercedes on behalf of these wicked people, these Israelites that are complaining and grumbling in the desert. They're complaining about having water and not having wine. They're complaining about having quail. They're complaining about manna. They're complaining about the desert. They're you know, they complain about all these things, and, and God's anger comes against them. But Moses intercedes for God's people over and over and over and over. And in response to that, God dispenses blessing and grace to his hurting people. When we're returning to the Lord, and we're serious about repentance and, and expressing it through prayer, we need to believe, right? The book of James says, when we ask something of God, we should believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown toss to and fro. That person should not believe they're going to receive anything from the Lord. They're a double-minded person, unstable in all that they do. So when we come to the Lord in prayer, even a sliver of faith, Jesus said, if you just have the faith of a what? A mustard seed, just something small. God can use that, and he can expound that. It's okay not to have a lot of faith, but you've got to have faith that God hears you and that he rewards you for coming to him and that he's going to take you and receive your confession and that he's going to make you right. Now, what are some other aspects of this, right? So Samuel's praying. He's interceding for them before the Lord. But we also see that they were fasting, right? When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and they poured it out before the Lord. And on that day, they fasted and they confessed, we have sinned against the Lord. Now, upon first glance, you say to yourself, what's with the pouring out of water? It is the desert. It is like 110 degrees in the shade there. So why are we pouring away the good water? It wasn't like it was in bountiful supply. But what was the whole point of them pouring out the water, taking it, dipping it, and pouring out the water before the Lord? What was the point of that? It was faith. Just like going without food, they were showing God us coming to you and drawing strength from you is more important, not only than our food, but than our very water to survive. Instead of drinking water, we're going to depend upon you completely. And to prove it, we're pouring the water out on the ground. Now, brothers and sisters, there's no turning back, right? If you pour out your water, you're without. If you go without food, you're without. It's do or die. God's either in your corner or he's not, right? It's like... Uh, Cortez coming to the new world and the old legend is that when he came to the new world and his guys got off the ships that they'd been at sea for many months and got on the land that while they were out figuring out their way and doing all that what did he do to the ships he set them on fire and he burned them in the ocean why did Cortez burn down his ships because then there's no turning back for all his explorers there's only one way forward people and that's to find what we're supposed to find because there's no turning back. And that's kind of what Israelite, the Israelite people were doing here. They're fasting, and they're even going without water, and they're confessing, we have sinned against the Lord. So you see this, this repentance pieces that we add fasting to that, and we add fasting even without water, and we, and we add confession to that. Now, how many of us practice fasting from time to time? I think it's a discipline in the ancient world, in the Old Testament, it's a discipline in the New Testament. And it's a discipline that you and I, as modern-day believers, should still practice from time to time. It's a good thing. In fact, now, 
Now science is getting behind it, right? Intermittent fasting. You can lose weight with intermittent fasting. You can fast this amount of time, and it gets your diabetes right, and get your calories right, and get your heart right, all these things. And now science is backing up what God's been talking about for a long time. But the issue is that when we fast, we don't just go without food or go without something for no reason. We go without those things for a point, and that is to spend extraordinary amounts of time with the Lord in relationship with him, praying to him, confessing sin, getting right with him, and trying to make sure that we're tight with him. Does that make some sense? That's the whole point of this. And so they, they fasted, they prayed, they confessed sin. And, and, and so this whole idea is they were going to make sure that what Samuel challenged them to do, get rid of your idols, get rid of the rivals to God. Make sure you're turning back and you're serious. Now, next month is a big event. In just a few days, about 26, 30 days, a big event comes out in the United States. That is the last of the four Avengers movies. Avengers Endgame, okay? So it's marked on our calendar, April 26, the last of the four. Don't pretend like some of you are not into it either, okay? Because I know you are. And we were watching a couple of those shows last night, getting prepped for it and all that stuff. And so Avengers Endgame is coming. And if you lost, if you watched the last one, Infinity War, you watched how like half of the heroes got killed by Thanos, okay? Now, it was horrible. And, you, and what you're starting to think about is, am I going to lose my guy? Well, my guy's Captain America, the Avenger. The ori- By the way, he's the original Avenger, okay? He's like the Superman of the Marvel Comics universe. He's the man. And, and, and I'm like, you know, I don't want to lose Captain America. And so I'm trying to figure out who could possibly die in Endgame. Who could possibly be gone? So I'm looking to see what movies are going to be made for other characters. Well, if they're going to have movies in the future, they can't die now right now, right? The bad news is Captain America doesn't have more movies to be made. So I don't know what's going to happen to my guy. But I found out Black Widow is going to have a series of movies made. Okay, so I thought, okay, she survives the end game. So I started watching a couple of the big parts of her and the Captain America things, and, and there's this part where she says to Hawkeye in one of the movies, she's a former Russian spy, a bad girl in her previous life, and she says, I have red in my ledger, and I want to erase the red out of my ledger. And she's talking about getting right for her sins of the past, for her assassinations and her spy and then all those bad things that she's done. You see here that the Israelites are getting rid of the red in their ledger. They're getting white as snow. Psalms 32, 2 through 6. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though groaning all day long. Have you ever held on to your sin? You don't want to give it up to God? It becomes pretty heavy burden, I'm just telling you. And David says, it made me waste away. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Verse 5 of Psalms 32. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my sin. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And guess what God did? And you forgave my sin, and my guilt went away. That's the response of each of us when we come to the Lord. When we get rid of the idols that are fighting for the place of the Lord, we got to confess them, right? And God will forgive the guilt of our sin. Therefore, verse 6, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Prayer expressed in confession. Prayer expressed in reliance upon the Lord. Prayer expressed in faith that God is going to forgive you and restore you and make you right with him. These are all critical parts because in verse 8 they said to Samuel, do not start crying out to the Lord for our God that he may what? He may rescue us. They believed that God was going to come through for them. And as we finish the chapter, we see that God does. God comes through with them and they rout the Philistines, right? Their Philistines go underneath the hand. So if you've walked away from God, if you have an issue with God, you need to be able to take your Philistines, so to speak, to the Lord. Take your Philistines to the Lord. God's grace will be sufficient 
to meet you there. And then the last thing that I want you to see, trust and obedience results in restoration. Let's, let's move on down just a little bit to, to verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone, and he set it up between Mizpah and Shem, and he named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were what? They were subdued. Verse 13, And they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that were the Philistines had, that they had captured from Israel were what? Were restored back to Israel. And Israel delivered the neighboring territories from the hand of the Philistines. And they even had peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. And from year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was. And he held court there for Israel. And he built an altar there to the Lord. We see the end game of our repentance and prayer, of returning back to the Lord. As Israel was serious about doing this, as they were turning back to God, as they were getting rid of the rivals in their lives, as they were confessing sin, as they were getting right with the Lord, suddenly, unlike before, God is there for them, right? Do you remember when they took the ark three chapters ago? They grabbed the two priests, Hophni and Phinehas, in the ark, and they rushed in the battle with the Philistines. Did they win? No, 34,000 of them fell in a day. Why? Because they trusted in themselves and not in God. The ark in themselves had become their God. But here, because they're right with God, God gives them long-term success against the Philistines in their lives. When you repent of your sin, when you turn back to the Lord, when you seek his face and desire his heart and to please him and you long for him, when you restore that relationship with him, there is blessing and restoration that comes in abundance. We see it in this text here, right? This Ebenezer in verse 12, this stone of help. What's with the stone of help? You, you probably, if I go to your house, you have a stone of help out front at your gate, right? That I pass by the stone of help. Probably not. But back then, they would take these special stones and they would mark them in a certain way. Then when other people saw those stones, they would remember what God had done there. Joshua did it, right? When he came into the promised land, he was conquering the Canaanites. Others had done it. Jacob had done it in the book of Genesis. And here, he's talking about God is our stone of help. What is he talking about? The Israelites are experiencing God's blessing. And in the Old Testament, Genesis 49, 24, God is called the stone of Israel. A stone is something strong. A stone is something hard. A stone is something that you can build upon, right? Jesus says in the New Testament, you can build your life upon a house, like a house built upon sand, or you can build your life upon Jesus Christ, which is like a house built upon a what? A rock, a stone. It's interesting Old Testament, God is called the stone of Israel. He's also called in the book of Psalms, in about 15 places I could find, the helper of Israel. The helper of Israel. So they're referring back to God is our stone of help. He is our helper. He is the one who carries us along. We can rely upon him like you can rely upon a heavy, hard stone. It's always going to be hard. And our God is always going to be there for us. And they can rely upon this God, right? And what resulted? The Philistines were subdued. And they stopped their invasion of Israel all throughout Samuel's lifetime. It reminds me of the book of Proverbs. It says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he causes even his enemies to live at peace with him, right? And in this text here, it says, they were even at peace with the Amorites, right? They were even at peace. So the result of repentance and trust in God is God's blessing upon us. It may be health, it may be wealth, it may be a business, it may just be peace with our enemies. It could be a restoration of a relationship, and most of the time it is. When we get right with God, it's amazing how we often get right with each other, amen? When we get right with God, often that bleeds over in a supernatural way to making us right with each other. It's a powerful thing. So if you're concerned about a relationship in your life, maybe that's something you need to be seeking the Lord on. Not just for his favor, 
but make sure you root sin out of your own life and get rid of your rivals and then pray. Intercede on their behalf, right? And see what the Lord does. As your relationship grows tight with the Lord, watch to see what the Lord does with that relationship as you continue to pray for it to be restored. In verse 14, there's this restoration. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were what? Were restored back to Israel. Do you ever feel that sometime when you're away from the Lord in your life that you missed out on certain things? I know I have. That because I wasn't walking with the Lord, I missed out on a blessing or I missed out on a particular thing. Well, this is the thing about the Lord God, our God, that we serve. Jesus Christ is in the business of redemption and restoration. Amen? That's what he's in the business of. In fact, the big storyline of the scriptures is God created man in his image. We messed it up with sin in the fall. Jesus Christ came to redeem it all. And then the, the closing part of the storyline, the plot of the scriptures is God restores all things to what they were supposed to be. The new heaven, the new earth become one with the new Jerusalem, and in the center of it is Jesus Christ on his throne. We don't need the moon by night or the sun by day because Jesus provides all the light that we need. There'll be no more night. Everything is right. It is shalom. Everything is full and whole. Integrity, peace, perfection. And that's what we're talking about here, is God sometimes has a way. He's just powerful to do this. In Joel 2.25 it says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The farmers understood when the locusts come in, they eat everything, right? There's nothing left. And you lose it all. You've spent your whole time putting the seed in the ground and watering it and taking care of it and everything else, and now it's all gone. But when you rely upon God, he has a way to supernaturally restore that which is lost in our lives. It's not just in farming. It's spiritually, relationally, health-wise, a variety of things. I've seen it over and over and over and over that when people got right with God, they truly got right with God. They got down to the nitty-gritty and got rid of a lot of things they've been holding on to and gave it all up to God. Their health improved. Their mental health certainly improved. Their relationships improved. And often relationships that were broken for there's one particular man I think I've mentioned before that his relationship with his father had been broken for 51 years. Now think about that. He was in his 70s. His father was in his 90s. His father on his deathbed that he prayed for for 51 years to accept Christ and to want to have a relationship with him again, three days before he died, he accepted the Lord and called for his son, who was a colonel in the Air Force, to come home from South Korea where he was stationed. And he spent 72 hours with his son, apologizing for the evils that he had done to him as a child, asking for his forgiveness and making life right. That is a true story of a deacon that I served with at Vista Rome. God has a habit that when we're right with him, that he restores and redeems and makes right things that are lost in our lives. Isn't that a beautiful thing? God does it. Now, does it mean he's always going to do those things? No. We, we, he's God. We're not. I don't get to strong arm the Lord. Can you strong arm Jesus? I mean, come on. It's like me getting in the ring with the Hulk. You know, I mean, he's going to beat me down. He's not going to work. But God loves. Isn't it just like our God tastes and sees that the Lord is good? Our God loves to give grace and mercy and love and kindness and wonderfulness to his children. That's the whole essence of the gospel throughout the, the scriptures that is our God is that way. And if he's that way, he often restores that which we've lost even despite our own sin. What a wonderful thing. And they had peace between Israel and the Amorites. And it's very interesting, these word pictures that are used at the end. Samuel the interceder that we see all throughout this text. Ebenezer the stone of help all point to Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is in the New Testament, in the book of Corinthians, the what? We sung it earlier, the cornerstone of the church. We just got done singing the song, cornerstone, right? That's what that's all about, is that Paul says Jesus Christ is the cornerstone 
of which all the church you and I are built upon. We all stand or fall based upon him, and he is reliable. He's the rock that we can build our lives upon, right? He is the Ebenezer, the stone of help of the New Testament that we see shadowed here in the Old Testament. And Samuel the interceder is a type of Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate interceder that Hebrews 4, 4 that I was talking about before, verses 14 and 15 says that Jesus Christ stands at the right hand of the Father to intercede for you and I. And that he's there eternally to intercede on our behalf. Do you think about the fact that Jesus is praying for you possibly right now? He does. He prays for you all the time. He whispers into the Father's ear how precious you are as his son and daughter, how much he desires for you to conform to being more like him and for your life to express the fullness of Christ. God is always doing that. And if you think the Father and the Son are the only ones that are involved in interceding for you, Romans chapter 8 tells us the Holy Spirit does the same thing. And it puts it in a different way. It says that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. That's the word used with groans that we don't even understand. When we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf to the Father for us. Now, have you ever thought about that? The Trinity is intimately Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God, one God, three persons praying for you, right? The Son and the Spirit praying to the Father for you. That's a powerful thing. That's this Jesus Christ is this Ebenezer Strong. He is this interceder on our behalf. And this is only possible because of one thing. And that is him coming to earth to be one of us. Him dying on the cross in our place. Him bearing the full anger of God against our sins. Drinking it in, paying the price, and making us right by giving us his free gift of eternal life. And Jesus doesn't just say that it's eternal life. Jesus says that you will have eternal life forever, but also that you'll have abundant life now. Amen? John 10.10, I've come to that you might have life and have it to the full. He's talking about now. The kingdom of God, when you make yourselves right with the Lord, is ushered in now in your life. And it continues on into eternity. So as we've been looking at this issue of returning to the Lord through repentance and prayer, expressing our faith in those ways, the question for you today is a couple of things. Are you dealing with rivals to the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? We've been preaching on this for three weeks. We've been talking a lot about it. What has the Holy Spirit been gently nudging you on that are rivals in your life? Something that you may like, something that you may be dependent upon or leaning upon, but that really you know God's been talking to you about you need to give up and let him take its place. These are the things that God wants us to deal with, right? We can't expect our community to change until God's house is right first, amen? God has no obligation to change Delta County and make it better when God's people sitting in his house aren't giving their lives to him first, amen? It starts first, according to the scriptures, with the house of God, God's people. And so I want you to gently just listen to the Spirit. What is he talking to you about? What are the rivals in your life that you need to give up? Now's the time to deal with that. And second of all, for points of application, you need to ask yourself, where am I at relationally with Jesus? Have I ever given my life to Christ by confessing my sins and asking him to save me from my sins and make me right with the Father? Have I ever been saved from my sins? Have I ever given my life to Christ and become a Christian? If you haven't done that, that's job number one for you today. I just ask that you consider that. You can talk to me during the altar call or you can talk to me afterwards. You can call me at home. I don't care. But let's have that conversation about how you can be right with the Lord. And if you're a believer and you've already done that and you've become a person of faith and a follower of Christ and a believer, we still battle, let's be honest, we still battle by walking away from the Lord, amen? It's hard stuff. And maybe you've just edged just a, a little bit away from the Lord, walking closer to Him. Boy, if you're walking in dangerous ground, you can't get out of alignment, can you? 
friend of mine who was in Vietnam talked about walking through a minefield. And his colonel in front of him was leading the way, and he said, where I step, you step. What I do, you do. When I stop, you stop. His buddy in front of him misstepped one time, and it cost him a leg. The spiritual life that we live is a dangerous place in this world. God says, keep in step with me. Galatians 5 says, keep in step with the Spirit. Are we edging off the path, and are we in danger of the landmines of this life? 